Hi, welcome to the first episode of U.S. History, but interesting. The series where we go through American history connecting with the past by Alan Brinkley chapter by chapter and talk about what the textbook says, what it doesn't say, and why you should care about this history right now in the 21st century. Today, we're covering chapter one, The Collision of Cultures. Let's get into it. Part one, what your textbook says. About 10 to 13,000 years ago, the first humans migrated from Asia and the Pacific to what we now call the Americas. Most famously, people crossed the ice bridge that formed between Russia and Alaska in a sort of Paleolithic prequel to ice road truckers. It's also possible that humans may have come to the Americas from Japan or Polynesia by ship. These people were initially hunter-gatherers, but agriculture was eventually developed in Mesoamerica, that's Mexico and Central America. Their crops included what many cultures called the, quote, three sisters, which are corn or maize, beans, and squash. Now, there were a number of Mesoamerican civilizations, including the Olmecs, the Maya, and eventually the Aztecs. We tend to know more details about their history because they developed their own writing system, and they built big fancy stone buildings that you can still look at today. Meanwhile, in South America, the biggest empire was the Inca in modern-day Peru. They farmed potatoes and corn on terrace farms, and they built paved roads through the mountains. And although they didn't invent a writing system, they did have a way of conveying numbers through knotted cords called quipu. Now, indigenous civilizations in what is today the United States were generally less centralized, but we shouldn't take that to mean that their cultures or even their governments were less complex or more primitive than their cousins to the south. One great example of that is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or the Iroquois in English. This was a political unit that was created from five separate nations for the explicit purpose of preserving peace in the region, and it's considered one of the oldest participatory democracies in the world. I don't have time to go into the details here, but there's an excellent video from a channel called Historia Civilis that goes into how the Confederacy was structured and why that structure in particular was effective in the context in which the Confederacy was created. Now, Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I'm about to make a lot of broad generalizations about indigenous cultures. Just remember that what is today the United States is roughly the same size as all of Europe, and especially during this time period, travel across the continent would have been incredibly difficult. So you should expect to see even more diversity among indigenous North American cultures than you see across European cultures from places like Spain, Russia, Iceland, Albania, and so on. In general, Native American cultures in the East and the Southwest practice agriculture, cultures along the Gulf Coast and in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska fed themselves by fishing, and cultures in the Great Plains were hunter-gatherers. Culturally, and again I'm oversimplifying, but a lot of indigenous cultures in North America believed in a singular creator being, and they tended to see the Earth as a gift that they had been entrusted to protect, oftentimes characterizing it as a mother figure. These societies also had their own gender roles that didn't always line up with what Europeans were used to, often putting women in positions of leadership, although war was often still led by men, and often tracing lineage through the mother rather than the father, as was common in Europe. One cool specific thing is the Diné or Navajo clan system. Basically, people tracked their lineage back two generations, and they discouraged intermarriage between people of the same clans. This prevented people from marrying their cousins at a time when the most powerful families in Europe were already centuries deep into a system of inbreeding that would eventually lead to some of the most powerful and also least competent monarchs in their history. Okay, so moving on to Columbus and the Columbian Exchange. Now, the traditional mythos is that Christopher Columbus was the first person to realize that the world was round and that you could sail to Asia by going west from Europe. In reality, that's not true. People had known the Earth was round for over a thousand years at this point. The actual dispute was between people who thought Asia was like real far away and Columbus who thought it was like probably not that far, you guys, and we shouldn't really worry about it. Now, Columbus was wrong, but he also got insanely lucky because it turned out there was a whole nother continent that he didn't know existed right where he thought Asia was. He landed on an island that he thought was Japan, which we now know as not even remotely Japan, or Hispaniola for short, and inadvertently touched off one of the most important single events in human history, the Columbian Exchange. Now, the moment that Columbus landed and established a permanent connection between Europe and the Americas, thousands of years worth of independent development of plants, animals, diseases, cultures, language, and philosophy came crashing together. As an example of how big of a deal this was, consider the fact that tomatoes are native to the Americas and not to Europe. That means that at the time Columbus was born, Italian food had no tomato sauce in it. This may seem like a small thing, but it helps to realize that much of the food that we consider natural and emblematic of different cultures today wouldn't have been possible just a few hundred years ago. But there were also less fun parts of the Columbian Exchange. You see, 
because these populations had been isolated from each other for so long, they hadn't been exposed to the same diseases, which meant that populations on either side of the Atlantic hadn't been given a chance to develop any immunity to the diseases from the other side. Smallpox, bubonic plague, measles, and other illnesses ran rampant across the Americas. We don't know for sure how many people these diseases killed, but estimates range from 80 to 95% of all Native Americans in the first century after contact. Using a relatively conservative estimate of about 50 million people living in the Americas at that time, that's at least 40 million people dead. After diseases, some of the most influential imports from Europe were animals. Things like pigs, sheep, and cows didn't exist in the Americas before Columbus. And perhaps most importantly, the horse, which revolutionized many North American societies, particularly in the Great Plains, where horses would become used in both hunting and warfare, and also as a measure of wealth or importance. Now, the last thing I'll touch on here is the people. Obviously, some Native Americans traveled back with Columbus to Europe, but the vast majority of the population shift happened in the opposite direction. Over the course of the following centuries, Europeans came flooding into both North and South America, and eventually, with them, they would bring enslaved African people. Now, we'll come back to the horrors of African enslavement in the Americas in later lectures, but for now, the textbook gives a little context on the cultures that enslaved African people were being drawn from. Most of the Africans who were brought to the land that would eventually become the United States came from West Africa, south of the Sahara Desert. This region had been trading with North Africa and by extension Europe for over a thousand years at this point, and their societies reflected it. Many West Africans had converted to Islam when traders brought it south with them, and several powerful empires had risen in the region with economies based in part on that trade with the rest of Africa. The two most notable were the Ghana Empire and the Mali Empire, which is famous for its king Mansa Musa, who was one of the richest men in human history. Like Native American civilizations, West African civilizations were very diverse, ranging from the empires we just talked about to nomadic hunter-gatherers. Your textbook points out that a lot of African societies tended to be matrilineal and generally have a greater degree of sexual equality than societies in other parts of the world. Their economies included agriculture, fishing, trade, and importantly, slaves. It's worth noting that African slavery generally wasn't permanent and didn't automatically pass to the children of enslaved people in the same way that it would in the Americas. The point is that the slave trade did already exist before the 16th century. Europeans didn't invent it, but what they did do is massively increase its scope and worsen some of its most dehumanizing aspects, as we'll see in later lectures. So we just talked about some of the long-term effects of Columbus's voyages, but now let's jump back into that narrative and talk about how the Spanish Empire in the Americas actually developed and some of the big events that helped the Spanish establish dominance over so much territory. After Columbus, there was a second wave of Spaniards who were called conquistadores, which is Spanish for conquerors. Their goal was to conquer these large Native American empires that we talked about and convert their people to Christianity. The TLDR is that they succeeded, although the conversion to Christianity would be more complicated, as we'll see in a minute. As for conquest, in 1518, Cortes led an expedition to conquer the Aztecs. In the 1530s, Pizarro conquered the Incas. In the 1540s, Spain sent several expeditions to the southern parts of what is today the United States. These conquests were greatly aided by a couple of factors. One is the disease we talked about. Two is political instability that happened at the same time. And the other factors are technological advances that the Europeans had, such as steel weapons and armor and gunpowder. On the religion side, Catholic priests and friars accompanied all of these expeditions, and they spread Catholicism through all of these conquered lands. In 1565, the Spanish built a fort in St. Augustine, Florida. This was the first permanent European settlement in what is now the United States, but it was also in Florida, so it's a little bit hard to take it super seriously. In the American Southwest, the Spanish established a colony at the end of the 16th century in what is now New Mexico. They conquered some of the local Pueblo people and granted encomiendas to the Spanish colonists. Your textbook doesn't give a lot of detail about how the encomienda system worked. It just says, quote, the Spanish demanded tribute from the local Indians, and at times commandeered them as laborers. Now, that phrase, commandeered them as laborers, isn't super clear to me, so let's ask Wikipedia what that means. Encomienda. Uh oh. Part of a series on slavery. Form of communal slavery. Oh. We couldn't even make it through the first chapter without whitewashing an atrocity. <sighs> well, to be fair, this is one of the most common mistakes to make while writing about history. 
We'll go into more detail about the encomienda system in the what your textbook doesn't say section, but for now, just know that this was another form of slavery. Anyway, back to the Pueblo people in New Mexico. The Spanish attempted to convert them to Catholicism, even going as far as to forbid indigenous religious practices and burn masks, prayer sticks, and effigies associated with those practices. In the 1670s, there was a famine, and there were raids from the Apache that the Spanish and the Pueblo together couldn't defend against. In 1675, in response to these raids, the Spanish governor arrested 47 Pueblo medicine men and accused them of practicing sorcery. Four of them were executed, but one of the survivors, a man named Pope, went on to lead a successful revolt against the Spanish in 1680. The Spanish weren't able to retake the region until 12 years later, and they wound up having to put down another Pueblo revolt in 1696. These uprisings earned the Pueblo some freedom to practice their religion and some property rights, but at a great human cost. Your textbook tells us that through a combination of disease, war, and migration, the Pueblo population in New Mexico declined by as much as 50% between 1680 and 1750. Now, I want to shift our focus back to Europe for a second. See, at this point, Europe's understanding of economics was based on something called mercantilism, which essentially says that whatever country has the most money wins. So one consequence of that belief was that countries wanted to make sure they had more exports than they did imports. Essentially, the logic was, if I sell more stuff than I buy, I wind up getting money, which is good. And whoever bought that stuff from me, who is usually a neighbor that I might want to fight a war with, ends up losing money, which is also good. Now, the second consequence of a mercantilist understanding of the economy was that finding an entire continent full of gold and silver was basically the ultimate cheat code. So because of their empire in the Americas, Spain essentially won the economy forever. Unfortunately, it turns out that's not actually how the economy works at all. So Spain became fabulously wealthy for a little bit and then super broke for a long time because of inflation and the fact that they spent all their money on a big fleet to invade England, which failed catastrophically. Speaking of England, they would get in on the game of colonizing the Americas by the end of the 16th century, but they had some things they had to resolve at home first. You see, early in the 16th century, the English king Henry VIII was so devoted to his hobby of divorcing and killing his wives that he had to invent a whole new church. This caused internal conflicts between English people who wanted the church to stay Catholic and people who wanted it to become even more Protestant. Some of the people on the Protestant side of things became what's called separatists, meaning that they wanted to separate entirely from the Church of England. One of the ways they would eventually find to do that was to set up their own societies in America. At the same time, England was developing a domestic cloth industry and starting to sell that cloth abroad. This made the merchants happy because they made money, and it made the mercantilists happy because exports are good. But it was a problem for rural English people who were kicked off of their land in what's called the enclosure movement because their farms were being converted into pastures to produce wool to fuel the cloth industry. These people were now jobless and homeless, and they came into the cities to become either wage workers or in many cases, beggars. Richard Hacklett, whom your textbook describes as a, quote, outstanding English propagandist for colonization, essentially argued that these people should be sent to the Americas on the grounds that he was tired of having to look at poor people all the time. And also, the colonies would provide England with resources that it needed to feed its growing industries. Your textbook notes that England's first colonial endeavor was not actually in the Americas, but in Ireland. There, the English built what they called plantations, which were essentially copies of English society with English colonists and no natives. The English viewed the Irish as savage and largely subhuman. They had to be subdued, controlled, and eventually either civilized or destroyed. Unfortunately, this mentality led to not only centuries of oppression of the Irish in both Europe and in America, but also to even more brutal English treatment of Native Americans whom they saw as even more subhuman. So around the turn of the 17th century, England, France, and the Dutch Republic started serious efforts to colonize America. The French would initially settle in Canada, founding Quebec in 1608, and building a relatively light colonial presence based around the fur trade. Shortly afterwards, the Dutch would establish a city called New Amsterdam, which would eventually become New York City. On the English side, the first attempts to establish permanent colonies in Newfoundland and Roanoke in the 1580s would prove largely unsuccessful. However, the desire for new colonies was still there, so in 1606, King James I set up new charters for groups of merchants from London and Plymouth. These groups would go on to establish the first permanent English settlements in America, but not until the next chapter. Part 2. What your textbook doesn't say. I mentioned earlier that the Brinkley textbook didn't talk much about the encomienda system. If you're following along in the AMSCO book, you got a little bit more of this, but I still want to go into more detail. 
At a high level, the way the encomienda system worked was that the Spanish crown would grant an encomienda for a specific plot of land to a specific person, an encomendero. The encomendero didn't directly own the people on that land, but he had a legal right to extract tribute from that land in the form of money and or slave labor. This meant that if the encomendero worked someone to death, he didn't actually lose anything because he still had the same right to the same amount of labor from whoever was left alive on the land. Because of this, and because one of the primary uses for Native American labor in the early years of the Spanish Empire was in silver mines, which are particularly hazardous because you have to work with liquid mercury, which is poisonous, many, many people were killed by this system. Now, the AMSCO textbook includes the story of Bartolomé de las Casas, a Spanish encomendero turned priest who realized how terrible this system was and lobbied the king for its abolition. It's worth noting that de las Casas originally advocated that they use African slaves in place of the encomienda system, but he eventually recanted that and decided that all slavery was bad. Anyway, because of the work that Bartolomé de las Casas did, the king issued the new laws of 1542, which ended the forced labor aspect of the encomienda system and began phasing it out over time. However, as the AMSCO book notes, quote, conservative Spaniards eager to keep the encomienda system responded and successfully pushed the king to repeal parts of the new laws, end quote. It's worth talking about exactly how those encomenderos responded. You see, when the Viceroy of Peru tried to implement these new laws, the encomenderos launched an armed rebellion and killed him. Meanwhile, to the north and New Spain, the Viceroy was afraid that the same thing would happen to him, and he just chose not to enforce the parts of the new laws that would be most unpopular with the local encomenderos. Although the Spanish eventually put down the uprising in Peru, the king decided to reissue a watered-down version of the new laws that would be more acceptable to the encomenderos. As a result, the encomienda system was not officially abolished worldwide until 200 years later in the late 1700s. Now, the reason we care about this is that it clearly demonstrates that sometimes there's a gap between the text of a law and the implementation of that law in practice. And sometimes people who don't want to follow the law can use violent means to pressure the government into changing that law. While this specific example may not seem super relevant to U.S. history, we'll see these themes crop up again and again, most prominently in the lead up to the American Revolution and the Civil War. Part 3. What does this have to do with modern life? The Academy Award-winning film Dances with Wolves is about a U.S. cavalry officer befriending members of a Lakota community and eventually joining that community himself. It ends with the following quote. Thirteen years later, their homes destroyed, their buffalo gone, the last band of free Sioux submitted to white authority at Fort Robinson, Nebraska. The great horse culture of the plains was gone, and the American frontier was soon to pass into history. Now, that quote makes it seem like the Native American people themselves passed into history along with their culture, leaving nothing behind but stock characters and westerns and maybe a few racist sports team mascots. And if you grew up in a place like the one where I grew up, it's easy to believe that. But in reality, it's not true at all. As of the 2020 census, there were about 3.7 million Americans who identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, and if you include people who identified with American Indian or Alaska Native and some other race, that number goes up to 9.7 million, which was a 160% increase from the 2010 census. Beyond that, many of the nations that we talked about in this lecture still exist as political entities today. I mean, I literally went to the website for the Haudenosaunee Confederacy while I was putting this video together, and the federal government recognizes about 570 other tribes in both the Lower 48 and Alaska on top of that. What exactly the relationship between those tribes and the U.S. federal government is, is a topic we'll come back to throughout this course, but suffice it to say, it's still vitally important to the living members of those tribes. And on top of that, Native Americans are becoming more involved with what you might consider to be the mainstream of American politics. You see, in 2018, Deb Holland of the Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico and Sharice Davids of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Minnesota became the first two Native American women ever elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Then, in the 2020 presidential election, we saw a massive increase in voter turnout among Native Americans in Arizona, flipping the state Democratic for only the second time since 1950. The margin in that state was less than the increase in Native American votes, so their community's involvement really did determine the outcome of the election in their state. And just earlier this year, one of those two representatives I mentioned earlier, Deb Holland, was sworn in as the Secretary of the Interior, making her the first Native American ever to serve in a president's cabinet. She referenced lessons that she learned from her family about her Pueblo culture multiple times during her opening remarks at her Senate confirmation hearing.
So hopefully that's enough to convince you that not only are Native American people still present and still taking part in American society, but their cultures that we learned about today still exist and are actively having an impact on broader American culture at this very moment. Well, that brings us to the end of the first episode in the series. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you guys enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and if you found this video informative, go ahead and share it with your friends. That sort of thing really helps to grow the channel. Next time, we'll be covering Chapter 2, Transplantations and Borderlands, in which English settlers come to Virginia and learn how to paint with all the colors of the wind, by which I mean they die in appalling numbers because of starvation. That's what that song is about, right? <laughs>